Praise God. Good stuff. Well, as you know, this setup ain't my setup. So we've got a guest in the house this morning. And uh, Nathan Pinocchio, I'm going to introduce him in just a minute and bring him up. Well, I am introducing him. I'm going to bring him up in just a moment. Um, Nathan is a part of the team. He's a founder of something called Theos U. Theos U is basically Netflix, but for theology. And uh, it's something that my wife and I personally use. We've used for about two years. It's the, something that our staff uses. Uh, they've just recently launched Theos Seminary, where you can get um, basically a master's of divinity, right? You can get a master's degree, you can get a, a certificate, you can get all kinds of cool stuff. Um, and basically their mission is to uh, basically create education that is accessible financially. Uh, so I think it's, it's like $100 a month for one of their entry levels. Um, and what they're doing is it's actually incredible. We were talking about it at dinner last night, is that they're actually reaching uh, spaces in the world. Uh, he was just in Indonesia, which God is just moving in Indonesia. But because it's a Muslim country, they won't allow pastors to lead a church unless they have a degree. And that's where Nathan's coming alongside. And the other thing I really like, uh, Nathan Theos U, is that they're historically uh, Christian. They teach Orthodox Christianity, not Eastern Orthodox, but true biblical teaching. And it's amazing. And I would encourage every single person in here at the end of the service, go in your app store, download Theos U. I think it's $14.99 a month. And it will be, well, it will be as good as Netflix. I can't say better because some of y'all really like Netflix, but it is as good as Netflix. It'll feed your soul. Come on, church. Can we welcome Nathan Pinocchio to the stage as he brings the word this morning? Thank you. Why don't you have a, actually, before you have a seat, turn to the best looking person you can find and say, you, it's good to be near you today. And then grab a seat. Thank you, team. That was awesome. Okay. Why don't we give it up for the team? That was just awesome. Okay. Well, here we are in Texas. All my exes live in Texas, <laughs> as the song goes. I never dated anybody from Texas. Missed opportunity. Um, I love your state, and um, I love what God is doing here. It's really cool. Um, Eric was catching me up on, you know, just what's been happening here at the church, and I, I could sense that God is here. Can you sense that, that God is here, and, and he's working, and... I mean, it's Texas, you know, like there's Christians here. It's pretty awesome. Um, I just moved from California, um, the devil's lair, um, <laughs> to Tennessee. Uh, my wife and I, we just moved there with our whole team, our whole Thassio team. And it's been cool uh, to see, like, it's weird. Um, I live in Franklin, Tennessee, and there's like, we have like Christians there. It's weird. And... Um, we had like a, a, a Christmas parade and like Matthew West, who's like this Christian artist, like led worship at our downtown Christmas parade. It was so weird. And then like, we're all going home and there's like dudes like praying for one another with their eyes closed on the street. I'm like, where are we? <laughs> it's just, it was so weird. And I just, I, when I think of Texas, I think it must be like that as well. Oh, it was just cool. Um, but all that to say, um, it's great to be here and just to get to, uh, hang with you guys this morning and to just see what God is doing. And um, yeah, a little, little bit about uh, my journey. So I'm a pastor's kid um, and I've been married to Jasmine for nine years. It'll be year 10. Um, and um, she's Australian, uh, which means she speaks English with a speech impediment. Um, <laughs> and I actually, I actually flew from Australia to here to be with y'all uh, last yesterday. So I'm a little bit weird at the moment. Not just the way I look, but the way I feel inside. Um, I'm a little bit, I don't know what time zone it is at the moment, but, um, but we're, we're feeling it. And then it had to be on the weekend that it springs forward, didn't it? So 
It's like no sleep, it's not happening. Um, so, uh, and then I have this team, yep, Theos U, doing it for, we've been doing it for about almost five years now. My brother and my brother-in-law, it's like a family business now. Um, and we just love um, biblical education. I, I went to a, a Christian school uh, from a, in fact, the, um, the curriculum that my local church used, so I'm Canadian, and this was in Ontario, Canada, where I'm from. And uh, I went to like a small Christian school. There's like 60 kids in this local church school. And the curriculum that we used was from Texas. It was like, it was called ACE, I believe, Accelerated Christian Education. It's like fundamentalist Baptist. Just, you know what I mean? That's, I'm a fundamentalist inside. I, I know I look like a progressive, but I'm, I'm, I'm really not. It's, I'm a ninja. It's, it's all a costume. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm thankful. I was just thankful for my Christian education. And, you know, when, when, I, when I was in New York, uh, I was at a church in New York for, for eight years. And, and I just found that there were so many people that were actually even doing ministry uh, that have just never had any, any Bible training. Um, and a lot of times the reason why we don't know more is because we don't have access to more and things are so expensive. And so our vision was, man, what if we had like a Bible college in your pocket uh, for like you know, the, the price of Netflix, and you can just watch Bible college courses. And so that was kind of Theos U. And then Theos Seminary is a degree granting, um, you know, Christian education. And, and same thing, a hundred bucks a month uh, to, to, you know, to go and get a bachelor or a master's of theology, et cetera. So we're just loving it. And um, our goal for master, or Theos Seminary is to scholarship every pastor in the third world. Um, so, uh, as Pastor Eric was talking, I was in Indonesia, and I was telling them, hey, we will scholarship, for free 99, we will put all your pastors through. And they're like, what? And I'm like, yes, let's do this. Um, so anyhow, that's what I'm passionate about. Um, okay. If you're taking notes this morning, this talk is called Sharks with Laser Beams. <laughs> of course it is. Um, we're going to read some scripture. Um, it's probably some scripture verse that you've, you've heard before, um, which, is, which is awesome. And then we're going, to, uh, we're going to think about it and talk about it, and we're just going to ask the Lord um, to speak to us today. So let's just do that. Father, thank you for your presence. Uh, Jesus, thank you that we're two are gathered in your name. You're there. There's more than two of us, so you're definitely here. Um, and we just sense your presence, Lord, this morning, um, both you know, in the Eucharist and, and just in worship and in our gathering. Jesus, we're here to meet with you, and you're here. And Holy Spirit, you're the one who wrote the Bible. Uh, you're the divine author of Scripture. And we know that every time we open Scripture, we get to hear from you, Holy Spirit. Um, and we want to hear from the Holy Spirit today. And so, Holy Spirit, as we read Scripture, I'm asking that you would speak so uniquely. And there's so many of us today um, and so we're asking you, Holy Spirit, that you would speak in two ways, corporately to us as a church and individually, because we all have unique situations and circumstances and challenges. And God, we know that you can speak in any way. So God, let your word just go forth and, and let it just disarm us. And Holy Spirit, we're asking that if there's any blockages in our hearts or in our minds, that you would just begin to rem remove them and that we would just humbly receive your word with meekness, that implanted word that's able to, able to save us. Um, so we thank you for that, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so let's read uh, Numbers 13. I'm going to be reading in ESV just because it agrees with my theology. Um, <laughs> And it's, it's like, if, if, we did the, if we read the message today, we'd be here all day. So uh, ESV just gets to the point. So here we go, Numbers 13. And like I said, you probably know this one. I think we're going to have it up on the screen, so if you didn't bring your Bible, that's okay. We got you. Okay. Is it there? Boom, it's there. Okay. So these were the names of the men whom Moses sent out to spy the land. And Moses called Hoshea, the son of Nun, Joshua. Um, now, when we arrive at this passage, what's happened is God has told Moses, hey, you're going to go and, you know, we come to the promised land. The goal is to take you to the promised non land, not hang out in the wilderness forever. Um, so God picks 
12 guys from the 12 tribes of Israel. And just previously, he listed out all the names of these random dudes that are going on this little camping trip, okay? And so Moses sent, uh, sent to them, them to spy out in the land of Canaan and said to them, go up into the Negeb and go up into the hill country and see what the land is and whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak or whether they're few or many, whether the land that they dwell in is good or bad, or whether the cities that they dwell in are camps or strongholds, and whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are trees in it or not. This sounds like going to the grocery store, and my wife has asked me to get a bunch of stuff, and I'm like, uh, oh, can you write it down? I always say, text, just text me, text me, stop talking, just text me. If you don't text me, I'm not going to get it. Um, so these guys have a laundry list from Moses to find out all this stuff. Obviously, somebody's writing this down for them. Um, be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin to Rahab near Lebo Hamath. Um, and they went up into the Negev and came to Hebron. Hebron is where God spoke to, to, to Abraham, showed up, and Abraham built an altar, and God's like, You're, I'm going to bring you back here. I'm going to bring your descendants back here. It's going to be amazing. I, I'm assuming that these guys, at least Joshua, would know, oh, yeah, th this is insane. This is the promise that God made to them, right? And it would maybe fill them with faith, right? Um, Ahimon, Sheshai, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, were there. Um, if you've read any Frank Peretti, That'll make you shake in your boots a little bit. Um, Hebron was built seven years before Zon in Egypt. Okay. Uh, they came to the valley of Eshkol. Eshkol literally means cluster. Um, and cut down from there a branch with a single cluster of grapes. And they carried it on a pole between two of them. That's rad. Those are some big grapes. Uh, my wife and I went to... Um, uh, a couple years ago, we went to this wine region in Australia, a really famous wine region in Adelaide. Um, in I believe it's called South Australia, and we went to this uh, Penfolds um, is like a really famous you know Australian wine. So we're in the Penfolds thingo, and they had uh, every single grape varietal, or, or uh, not every single, but about like 14 of them, really famous ones. You know, like the Cab Sav and. Pinot Gris, all that stuff. And so it, the time was the grape harvest that we were there. So it would have been in February in Australia because things are upside down there. And so um, February is like their August. And so the grapes are like bursting with juice, right? And they just let you just, okay, yeah, just go randomly, go down there and just, you know, check out the grapes. And I'm like, can I touch them? They're like, squeeze them, you know, like <laughs> bite them, you know, eat them, just go for it, you know, like. That's what they're for. They're for our, our customers to just like literally go nuts and just check out all the different grape varietals. And so that's what we did. And so I'm going up and down and I'm going, babe, this is insane. The Cab Sav ones are over here. And, and they, were, I, they were smaller than I imagined. I thought that they'd be like the, you know, the grocery store, the big ones, you know. They were pretty small. And like a single cluster, I could grab a cluster. And, then, and actually, I did this. I was grabbing clusters of grapes and I was like, squeezing them and just like drinking the juice. <laughs> Problematically, there were some bees there <laughs> and they began to chase me everywhere. It was amazing. Kind of ruined it, um, to be honest. <laughs> but for at least six seconds, it was, it was sheer bliss. Um, I felt like a Roman god, you know, just like, ah, you know. Um, so <laughs> I don't know where that came from, Roman god. Um, I don't even know if Roman gods do that. I just, just went with it. Um, so, um, so anyways, like, imagine a single cluster of grapes that is so big that two men have to put it on a pole. That's ridiculous. And the point is that this land that God has promised them is really delicious. It's so delicious, in fact, that it's ridiculous to try to bring some of the fruit back. Right? Pretty cool. So they got this, and they also brought pomegranates and figs. That was on, obviously, Moses' shopping list. He's like, don't forget the figs. I need them for, I just haven't been regular, so I just, I don't know. I just, sorry, I just went with it. I went with it. That place was called the Valley of Eshkol because of the cluster that the people of Israel cut down from there. At the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land. 
And they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And this is, like, this is supposed to entice them to go, look, this is amazing, right? And they told them, we came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey. That's ancient Near Eastern hyperbole for this place is fully loaded. Okay, fully loaded. Milk, it flows with milk and honey. Um, however, the people who dwell on the land are strong. And the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Yikes, Frank Freddy. The Amalekites dwell on the land of the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, all the mosquito bites, all the, the ites, <laughs> right? Point being that there's, like, there's a lot of people who are there that we're going to have to displace. They're not going to be just chill with us walking in. We're going to have some adversaries here, many adversaries. Um, but Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let's go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. Don't even know what that means. Kind of weird to say that, right? It, 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 it's obviously hyperbole. Um, and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. All the people, okay, apparently now everybody's a giant there. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak who, came from, who come from the Nephilim. Pause. If you've ever read Genesis 6, oh my gosh. You got to go read Genesis 6 after church. I don't have time to go there, but it's insane. It's insane. It's literally insane. In Genesis 6, it says that, that angels came and, and they saw beautiful women and like Vikinged them and like stole them as like war brides and then got them pregnant and created this other race. This like half angel, he's like half man, he's half bear, he's half pig, he's man bear pig. It's like, that's the Nephilim. The Nephilim are these dudes who are giants and they're not human, and they're not angel. They're like this mixed breed. And some scholars have said, well, the reason why Joshua is like so... Like why does Joshua tell the children of Israel? Well, God tells Joshua to kill everybody in the promised land. You ever wonder that? It's, like, it's kind of like pretty hardcore. Why doesn't God tell them to do that to Egypt, to Babylon, to the Assyrians? Um, and, the, and the idea is maybe God is aiming at the Nephilim bloodline because these angels were trying to subvert God's good purposes for humanity by creating a, another race, essentially, right? Something entirely different, not human. And so that's why maybe these people were just so bad, right? They were really weird. They're all kinds of sacrifices. And, and so God is like, yeah, that's not happening. And so the people of God are going to destroy um, the Nephilim bloodline. Uh, that's an aside but a fun one nonetheless. Go and read Genesis 6. It's crazy. Okay? And so this is what these people are saying. It's, it's the Nephilim. It's like, oh, right. And we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seem to them. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And they're singing songs that were written in Texas. Right? It's the first country music ever written. It's right there. It is sad. All the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, would that we had died in the land of Egypt or would that we had died in this wilderness. Um, and God's like, you know what? That's a, actually a good idea. Um, I might run with that later. Um, why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? No. No, it wouldn't be better for you to go back to Egypt. You want to know why? Because there's nothing left. You just freaking destroyed Egypt. It's in smoldering ruins. Right? You destroyed their army. You destroyed their crops. There's frogs and locusts everywhere. The Nile's blood. What are you going back to? You plundered them when you left. You took all the gold. 
right? And the Egyptians are probably not going to be happy to see you because, I don't know, you killed all their firstborn. (laughs) There's nothing to go back to. You hear me? Right? And they said to one another, let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. These people are not thinking straight. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the people of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. Kind of like it's like a funeral about to happen, which prophetically is exactly what's about to happen. And said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, the land which we passed through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. And if the Lord delights in us, P.S., he kind of does, right? We're the sheep of his pasture. We're like, he, he, we are this, his son. We are Israel, the, the, the children of God. He delights in us. He will bring us into this land and give it to us. And give it to us. Incredible perspective. God's going to bring us in, and he's going to give it to us. A land that flows with milk and honey, and there's that, the, you know, matching the, that, um, all the crazy that they're talking. Moses is now speaking prophetic crazy. He's employing that uh, hyperbole, the milk and honey, it's fully loaded. Only don't rebel against the Lord. Don't rebel against the Lord, because that, that's actually what's happening here. And do not fear the people of the land. They are bred for us. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Incredible passage. Well, if you know the story, God's like, um, yes. Yeah, so all you, this generation that grumbled and complained, you're all going to die here, and I'm just going to wait for you all to die, and then I'll take your kids into the promised land. And Joshua and Caleb, they survive, and then they lead this next generation that will believe God, right? But the unbelieving generation, they die in the wilderness of unbelief, Hebrews chapter 3. Okay, so Revelation 28, 21.8. Revelation 21.8. Now, if you've ever re- read the book of Revelation, it's a trip. It's a trip. It's not my favorite book to read. Got to be honest. It's like this crazy stuff happening. You know what I mean? I can only take so much apocalyptic lit a year, right? It's like end of the world type stuff. It's like, you know what? Can we not watch another zombie movie? Because I'm probably done for at least two weeks, right? My wife loves zombie movies. She's watching The Last of Us at the moment on TV. I'm just like, I just, I'm just not, you know, it's just too, it's too much. Can we watch the great British baking show or something? It's just more my pace. Watching British people eat pastry. It's just, let's do that, right? So that's the book of Revelation, you know, for me. Like, the great British baking show, that's the Psalms for me. You know, it's just like, the Lord is my shepherd. Yes. Green pastures. Yes. Cakes. Right? Um, Revelation is probably more my wife's speed. And so you you get at the end of Revelation, you get to Revelation 21. And so God's beginning to set the world to rights. And you're like, finally, you're like, thank God I got to Revelation 21. Okay, Jesus is sorting everything out. And all the bad guy, you know, he's not loosed anymore. And he's getting dealt with and all that. And, and here God's, you know, doling out the judgments. And, you know, the cowardly, the faithless. And the faithless, you're like, yeah, dunk them. The detestable dunk. Uh, murderers, double dunk them, right, into the lake of fire. Sexually immoral, dunk. Source, Harry Potter, dunk, right? <laughs> idolaters, dunk, liars, dunk. Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. But the thing is, is like, when I read this verse, you know, it says cowardly, and I kind of freak out because it's like, that's me. You ever read something in the Bible and you're like, no, Bible, calm down, Bible. No, 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 let's not dunk them. Let's be, no, let's be kind to those because that's, that's me, right? <laughs> I'm a, you know, I'll be honest with you, I'm a coward at times. Courage doesn't come naturally to me. Um, I'm a scaredy cat uh, by nature, uh, whatever you want to call me. I've got high anxiety and a vivid imagination. I got it from my mom. My dad's like stoic. My mom's like freaking out constantly. We called her Debbie Downer uh, growing up. My mom knows like how you could die right now. It's like, well, at churches, you know, light fixtures are just never screwed in that tight, and so you always need to keep a look. And it's like, really? Really, Mom? You know, like, 
So that's, that's the mother I grew up with, right? She knows how you could die at any given moment. Um, and so I was never the first guy in my friend group to do anything crazy, right? Uh, my brother Gabe is Braveheart. He's always got the blue paint on, and he just oozes, uh, really, it's stupidity, but courage, too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking over my shoulder like a, a nervous wreck constantly. Um, but I can remember from the time that we were kids, you know, Gabe would always be the one that if, you know, in Canada we got rivers and lakes, that's all we got. And so you're just always jumping into a river or a lake, you know, in Canadian summer when it, when it gets to 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, <laughs> it's like, we have two days of this, let's get wet. Um, and so Gabe would be jumping off. And like they tell you up there, they're like, okay, don't jump off of a bridge until you swim down there. Find out if there's any rocks or, you know, anything. And Gabe's just like, let's go. You know, I'm like, ah, ah, you know. Um, and my dad would be staring at me like, what, you're just going just gonna to stay there? And I'm like, I'm going in, Father, you know. Um, <laughs> Gabe, Gabe's like my dad. And, um, and so Gabe would, you know, he'd, he'd be doing, uh, you ever seen kids on swing sets? you know, and they're going real high, and then they'll like jump off at the highest point on a swing set. And it's like, why? Just stay on the swing. Like, uh, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't watch, most of what my brother would do, I just couldn't watch it, you know? Um, and somehow, I'm the one who, you know, wound up with broken wrists, but somehow he survived. It's, it's unbelievable. He shouldn't be alive, but he is. Um, and, you know, so he's doing his thing all the time, and I'm in the fetal position, just sucking my thumb and just looking away, you know, like... Um, we had this yearly youth group trip to um, the Canadian equivalent of, of a Six Flags. It's called Canada's Wonderland. And it's like insane roller coasters. I think the highest roller coasters in North America are still at Wonderland to this day. And it's just crazy. And it was the bane of my young adult existence because I knew that every summer as a teen, we'd have to go to Canada's Wonderland. And I'm a coward. And so all the other guys would be going on these rides, so stand up roller coaster, the mighty Canadian mind buster, it almost came off. You know, it's like, yeah, lo no, let's not do those, you know what I mean? But, but secretly, I wanted to be a part, I wanted to be fearless, I wanted to be brave, uh, but you know, I'd just be like, well, the girls aren't going, and I just ate a grape like three hours ago, and <laughs> I wanna protect the girls. You know, somebody needs to, to just look out for their, their honor, and I will do that, you know, like, <laughs> but on the bus ride home, while everybody else is talking about how amazing the roller coasters were, I'm like missing out. I'm like, Ugh. you know, I just wish I was brave. I wanted to be like Gabriel. I wanted to be the hero, you know, and in on all the stories. But I just didn't have the wherewithal uh, because I have a melty heart and I have a wild imagination. Um, and it's, it's a horrible combination. So now I had a good dad, and dad made me do hard things, and I learned that in life, if you don't face things and you, and you don't, so I began to face my fears in my later teens, I began to just, I went on roller coasters just, just to beat the fear, you know, like just, um, I used to have insane uh, flight anxiety. Now I fly all over the world, <laughs> and, you know, God helped me beat that, um, but it, the, it's not first nature for me. It's not first nature for me. Um, so I'm thankful for my dad who's, who kind of helped me, you know, taught me to, to challenge things, you know, and, and stare tough situations in the face. But, you know, in the natural, I don't like to battle Nephilim. I like short giants with pool noodles. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's more my speed. You know what I mean? Like, God, give me land where I have to defeat all the toddlers. I will slay them all. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> nobody can be above three feet. You know, like, <laughs> um, I remember reading somewhere that anxiety is an evolutionary, um, and don't get me wrong, I don't mean like we, you know, came from apes, but evolutionary as in survival. Um, it's an evolutionary survival mechanism. Uh, it's an emotional reaction. Anxiety is an emotional reaction that's basically meant to keep you alive. Um, and, and emotions are actually, they're like, like the lights that come on in your car. Um, and they tell you that you don't have what it takes to continue on. And so it's meant to keep you alive. So it's kind of like when you're barreling down the highway and you, you know, the fuel light comes on 
um, and emotions are, are like anxiety, et cetera, they're literally meant to, to, to protect you, okay? I gotta pull over, I don't have the wherewithal to, to fight this saber-toothed tiger. You know what I mean? I gotta, I gotta run because I forgot my weapons at home. You should have anxiety in certain situations. Like if, if you meet a saber-toothed tiger in the wild uh, and you don't have your bow and arrow, you should have anxiety, you hear me? And that anxiety, that fl fight or flight will kick in and it'll save your bacon, okay? Um, and so that's kind of how that, say hi. Um, and, and, and tell them why aren't they in church? Like, honestly, I was speaking today. It's just ridiculous. Okay, I'm kidding. <laughs> so it's designed, uh, anxiety has a good place. There, there, there is a place for anxiety. Paul literally says in the New Testament that the anxiety of, of, of the church, he had anxiety for the churches. Um, so there's a, there's a small amount of anxiety that is healthy. Um, for example, like my brother would be dead 6,000 years ago, right? Like because if the saber-toothed tiger comes, Gabe's like, let's get him. It's like, we don't have any weapons. No, we're not doing it. And then Gabe would be eaten. You know what I mean? Um, so the only reason, I don't know how he survived in the gene pool, but it is what it is. Um, it's designed to help you make the decision that will preserve your life. So naturally then, if you don't have the goods to survive, your mind is starting to sound all the alarms. And that is what's happening here in uh, our story. In Numbers 13 and 14, these guys recognize that they don't have the goods to defeat the giants, and so they're hitting the panic button. That's what's happening. Um, now, this is the problem. The problem is that the promised land wasn't on them. It wasn't on them. In fact, it wasn't even their idea. Right? It, it, was, it was about God's ability because it was God's idea. Uh, and what they were actually doing was mistakenly thinking that they were the ones that delivered themselves from Egypt. Right? They're the ones that, that destroyed the Egyptian art, army and made water come out of the rock and, and chicken nuggets fall from the sky. They thought that the promised land was their idea. Now, this is how faith works. Faith is when God tells you to do something. And then you believe God. And that God is able to do that thing that he's told you to do. That's, that's how faith works. Because faith comes by... There it is. See, faith is not assumption, it's not speculation, it's not presumption. It's hearing a person who's real. Biblical faith is not, well, we're just going to take a leap. No, that's, that's not biblical faith. That's not biblical faith. I'll give you an example. Um, I want a Cadillac Escalade. Okay? That's what I want. So judge me. It is what it is. I want, like, fully loaded... Right? The leather, the moon roof. I don't even want a roof. Tear the roof off. <laughs> okay? I don't even know the color yet, but it's going to have racing stripes, right? And the spinner rims and all that stuff. I want this ridiculous Cadillac Escalade. I want, brand, I, I want it and I want it now, right? Now, God has not told me that I can have a Cadillac Escalade. So I don't get to pray a prayer of faith for the Cadillac Escalade. Are you following me here? Because faith comes by, there it is. And hearing the rhema word of Christ, that quickened word or that now word. You can get a rhema from the logos, from the written word, but, but nonetheless, it comes from somebody. It's not assumption. It's not speculation. Faith is a response to a real person's words. Right? God initiates faith, and then faith is our response to his initiating word. So I pray a prayer of hope for my Cadillac Escalade. <laughs> and hope does not disappoint. <laughs> you hearing me, right? You can ask the Lord for things. Of course you should. There's no Santa Claus. There's only God, right? My parents were the ones who gave me the gifts at Christmas. That's right. So who are you going to ask? You ask your father if you want bread, right? He gives you good things, right? So that's, that's not a problem. Uh, but I can't pray a prayer of faith for it unless I've heard, okay? Now, um, faith, once again, doesn't start with you. It starts with God. Um, and if God calls me to do something and I chicken out, 
because of the giants and the lions and the tigers and bears, oh my, right? What I'm actually doing is I'm rebelling against God. And see, th this is the danger. Like, we, we want, love to talk about faith, but we don't like to talk about the challenges of it or the responsibility of it, right? God called Israel to, I mean, there were, the promised land was for them, but also to deal with, there was a very real thing that was going on. There was a spiritual warfare thing, the Genesis 6 thing that I was talking about. And Israel was called to deal with that thing. Like, to, it, was, it was warfare. Um, and so there's, a, there, there's, there's this, this thing that God wants to do in the earth, and they're called to do that, so they need to take care of that. Um, but they're rebelling against God because they think that it's all about them. They're rebelling against God because they don't realize how the relationship works. God says, hey, I want, I, I've called you to this. And if God's called you to that, then you can go, man, I can have faith for that. But if God calls you to something and you're like, no, I can't do that. It's not just I, you're chickening out. It's that cowardice that the book of Revelation is talking about. See, the book of Revelation is about being a faithful witness to Jesus Christ, even if it costs you. you if we want to sum up the book of Revelation, what's it about? Being a faithful witness. And the opposite of a faithful witness is a coward. Somebody who, who, it's not worth it. No, not, God's not called me to it. I'm just scared of it. I don't care what God says. I'm just going to protect myself. Once more, failure to believe that God will do what he said he will do is actually rebellion. And, and this, this is the type of thing that gets you dunked. Now, we, we have a major challenge in the church at the moment. We have some major challenges in the church at the moment. Um, God's told us to believe the Bible about what constitutes murder, but we take up less politically hostile positions uh, because ultimately we are afraid to be a faithful witness because of the inhabitants of the land. Um, God's told us to believe Jesus about marriage and sexuality, but we take up less socially volatile positions uh, online or in person or whatever it is because we are afraid of being a faithful witness. God's told us to train up our children in the ways of the Lord, but we fear that people will call us crazy and we cease to be a faithful witness to the work of God in the earth by failing to train our children to be faithful witnesses. Many of our young people, I speak at conferences all over the world, particularly, I'm the youth guy, I speak at youth conferences, and I've found that there's, a lot, there's many young people who've become cowards online yeah. because they're ashamed of the gospel. I, th I wonder if they've ever really read Romans chapter 1. Right? Paul's like, oh, this is the gospel. And then he just begins to preach. I mean, Romans chapter 1, you probably know, you're probably familiar with his work. It's, it's, pretty, it's not just God's a desperate boyfriend and he's obsessed with you. That's not the gospel. It's like a sliver of it. And it's not even really entirely all that. No, God's a king. Yes, he does love you, but he's not, you know, he doesn't need a restraining order against you. Um, they're ashamed of the gospel. The gospel is people's sin, and the wages of sin is death. It doesn't mean that we need to slam the Bible over people's heads or be a, you know, a verbally abusive to people or dishonoring, uh, but, but that's the gospel, that people sin, and there's sins in our culture that, that the culture needs to, people have to repent of. We all have to repent of sin, and, and, and that mean, means agreeing with God about our situation. God, I agree with you. I'm a mess. That's repentance. And, and young people, they cower to brands of Christianity that allow them to be an empathetic hero that puts people's lifestyles or preferences over God's Word. And it's not the church that they've rejected. Oh, just the church has just been so... No, no, the church has been faithful to God's word. We've been faithful witnesses. That's what we've been. Not, we're not perfect historically, but, but we've been faithful witnesses for the, for the great majority of, of, of human history. The church has been good for the world in, in, in majority. I think it was Tim Keller that said, secular humanism has slain its thousands, it's, uh, Christianity has slain its thousands and, and secular humanism its ten thousands. Um, Christianity has been good for the world. Some of you don't believe that because you've been educated or re-educated 
and you just have giant blocks of your history missing. And you need to go get educated about how good the church has been for the world. Hospitals, women's suffrage, abolition. I could go on and on and on and on. Education, tolerance, the entire idea of religious tolerance. Capitalism even. Freedom. The church has been good for the world. But there's this revisionist history that says that the church has been horrible for the world. Christianity is so bad for the world. No. No, it's been overwhelmingly good. And, and any claim to the contrary is just not historical fact. It's not been perfect, but it's been overwhelmingly good. And it's not hurtful Christianity that they've rejected. It's Jesus. Because you can't divorce Jesus from his words. And so many of our young people have become unfaithful witnesses. We, we, don't, we don't want to be ostracized by the beast in his, in his, his kingdom. The scriptures teach giving sacrificially to the work of the kingdom of God that is locally the church, but we're afraid that God won't come through, that God isn't able to make all grace abound toward us, that if we seek the kingdom and its righteousness, it's going to suck all of our resources and our life is going to be awful. That's cowardice. That's not being a faithful witness with your life, with your resources. When God's called us to be the church, what is Jesus building? The church. Jesus is building one thing, the church. He's coming back for the church. The church is his bride. The church is his vision. The church is who he died for. The church is who God saw before he even created humanity. He saw the church, his people. We are the Israel of God. We're the sheep of his pasture. He loves us. And that's what Jesus is building. So if you want to like get involved with what God is doing, you build the church. Be passionate about the church. And how do we know? You can have faith for building the church. Why? Because you know that that's what Jesus is building, what he's passionate about. And we have it in his word. God, what should I do? Build the church. Notice in Peter's restoration, God, you know, Peter, you're, you're, you're a hot mess. Do you love me? Yeah, I love you. Cool. Build the church. Right, it's even like part of our redemptive restoration. It's not just you and Jesus, it's you and Jesus and the church. When Jesus tries to reason with us because we get anxious about well, we get anxious about everything, but we get anxious about provision. In Matthew 6, you know this verse, but Jesus just says, like, God cares about birds. He's going to take care of you. God, God cares about the grass. He's going to take care of you. Oh, you a little faith. In Numbers 13, 16, Moses changes Hosea's name. Um, so Joshua's name and after the names are read, the, the names of the men whom Moses sent out to spy the land, Moses called Hosea the son of Nun Joshua. Now, Hosea means he saves. Joshua means Yahweh saves. And just before Joshua gets sent to be a spy for 40 days, Moses is like, I'm changing your name. Your name has meant that you save. It's in your power, right? But your new name is going to be Yahweh saves. That's a really significant moment for a name change. When, when, when Joshua is about to go and see all of the impossible, right? But imagine all his friends, are, they're calling him this, his, this new name now. It's this new identity. He's like, Yahweh saves. Hey, Yahweh saves, go get the water. You know, like, Yahweh saves, where you at? You know, and he's thinking, Yahweh saves, Yahweh saves. And so everybody else is seeing the Anakim and they're seeing the giants and they're, and, and they're thinking it's, because bef before it would have been, he would have seen it the same way, right? Hosea would look and he would feel the burden, like it's on him. But Joshua, Yahweh saves, looks and sees what God will do. Right? Really significant name change. Hosea would pee his pants a little bit when he sees the Anakim. Right? He's like, ooh, yeah, we're dead. 
right? Yeshua or Joshua sees the Anakim and wonders how God is going to destroy them. Is it going to be a roundhouse kick? Fireballs are going to come from heaven? I mean, is there going to be like some sort of angelic camel gang with matching vests and they're going to beat up the Nephilim? You know, like his prophetic imagination is running wild with how Yahweh is going to save because it's not on him. and it's not, He's not Hosea anymore. He's Joshua now and Yahweh saves. Hosea sees the grapes but he begins to catastrophize, catastrophize. And he's, he's saying, he'd say all the, you know, the, the hyperbole, oh, you know, the giants. And, oh. But Joshua sees the goodness that God is bringing. Hosea is panicking because it's all on him. Joshua isn't panicking because the battle is the Lord's. It's, it's Yahweh's idea. So I can have faith for Yahweh. If it's his idea, then he's gonna do it, right? The church is God's idea. So he's going to build it, and I can be a part of it. I can have faith for the church, because I know it's, it's in the revealed Word of God. Right? There's some things that you don't need to figure out. They've already been figured out for you. That's why we have Scripture. It's the general will of God that you be a part of a church. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as manners of some, right? And then, as you begin to read it, strategically, it's like, yeah, and you're, you're an arm, and you're a leg, and you're the body, and, and we need to be the body. We're called to be the body and to build this thing the church that Jesus is coming back for. Hosea is freaking out, right? Because, the, oh my gosh, well, you know, the new building project is gonna be such a stretch and I don't know how we're gonna possibly get it done and we need a kids area that is the best and, and so that we don't have 150 kids in like one small little room and I don't know how we're gonna do it. But Joshua is imagining prophetically how God is gonna be able to pull off another miracle and move hearts and supply seed to every sower. You know you're a part of a growing church, right? That's, that sucks. It's funny because it's true, right? Being a part of like something that God is doing isn't like all it's cracked up to be, right? People want to go to a good church, but they don't want to build a great church. They just want to come and it's like, oh yeah, it's just awesome in here. It's like, and, and the dude that's been there for 20 years is like, yeah, it's awesome now. You're welcome. You got, I, I sense that God is here and he's moving sovereignly and he's looking for some Caleb's and some Joshua's to go, hey, we're gonna build something that's gonna last, outlast us. A blessing to this community, a blessing to kids, a blessing to people. You know, Father's bringing people home and we gotta add some more water to the soup. Numbers 13, 32, the land devours its inhabitants. What are you talking about? That's, that's ridiculous. Land doesn't devour inhabitants. Only cowards say stupid things like that. Right? What, what are you talking about? Right? It's the equivalent of saying we saw sharks with laser beams on their heads. There were sharks, man, with, with laser beams on their heads, and they came out of a shark NATO, dude, and it, it was insane, bro. Right? And Joshua and Caleb are like, they're putting, they put their hand up, they're like, uh, there's no such thing as a Sharknado, right? Spitting out land sharks with laser beams on their, on their heads. What's wrong with you, <laughs> right? All the cowards in the, in the crowd are screaming, oh, did you hear that? Sharks with laser beams on their heads, we're so dead. It's better that we just died in the wilderness. <laughs> let's go back to Egypt. There's no, no, let's not go back to Egypt. What's wrong with you? When you're a coward, the first thing to run away is your imagination. And that's why, uh, see, see, when you're faithful, your imagination is actually the, the place where the prophetic can run wild. And you begin to see what God will do. You begin to dream about what God will do because you're a faithful witness and you know that it's on God, it's not on you. But what, what will God do? It's gonna be insane, I know he's gonna do it, I wonder what it's going to look like. Church, God has not brought you this far to leave you and forsake you. God's doing a new thing here, an awesome thing here. Think of all the work that he's done here, you know, in the, in the past. 
and, and, and brought you here and, and there will be ministries birthed out of here and there will be businesses birthed out of here and it'll all be blessed because this is, everything's leading to, to, a, to moments and, and, and impactful moments where God's going to begin to work in people's hearts and lives and, and the church is, Jesus isn't coming back for a weak anemic bride where we're just holding on and white knuckling it. No, he's coming back for a beautiful and glorious bride. And I don't mean to offend you, but I don't believe that there's going to be a secret rapture where the church just sucks and we just need to be rescued. I don't believe that. I don't believe that the scriptures teach that. I think there's going to be one obvious return for a beautiful, glorious bride. And absolutely, the world's going to get darker and darker. Awesome. But the glory of the Lord is going to shine all over the world. I believe that the church's best days are ahead of it. I don't care who's in the White House. I don't care. The church is unstoppable because Jesus is building it himself. If you're, if you're looking for like a great investment in, in uncertain times, invest in what Jesus is building in. Like think like if Elon Musk just went all in on something, he's, you know, you'd be like, yeah, I'm going all in on, on yes. If he, right, if he like took all of his portfolio and he's like, I'm going into casino poker chips. It's the next thing. You'd be like, I'm in, I'm, I'm in, you'd, right? You'd call and you'd be like, yeah, I'm in. I'm telling you right now, Jesus is all in on the church. He's all in and it's a safe investment. Don't be a coward. Don't rebel against the Lord. Be a church builder, full of faith, a faithful witness. Somebody who believes the word of God, is planted in the house of God, flourishing in the court of God, and is fruitful in every season. Because Jesus is the caretaker. Jesus is superintending the church. In Revelation 2 and 3, we see Jesus walking among the candlesticks. He's still superintending the church. He's in charge. Why don't you stand with me? Father, thank you today for your church. Father, thank you for a bold church, a courageous church, a church that takes ground. Father, I thank you that this church has incredible destiny. Father, I thank you that these are the early days, the days of small beginnings. But God, I thank you for what you're going to do. And I thank you, Lord, that you're raising up a Joshua and Caleb generation that will obey the Lord, that will have that prophetic imagination that runs wild. Father, I thank you uh, for a church um, that takes ground. And Lord, I thank you that you're going to provide seed to every sower, every, every person that goes, God, we're all in. On the, we're all in on your vision, your destiny, your will. God, the, the church wasn't our idea, it was your idea. The church was never our dream, it's your dream. God, the church isn't our invention, it is your idea, it's your purpose, it's your promise. Jesus, it's, it's who you're coming back for, and we're all in. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being your people. And we expect good things in the coming days. In Jesus' name, amen.